you know, we're, we're a family, you know, we're a team. Uh, we take a lot of pride being a small business owner and, um, you know, giving substantial, you know, places for good people to work. Um, we're going to take pride. And if we, you know, play our cards right and do the right thing that next year, you know, maybe we got two more trucks in the parking lot. Um, and as a small business owner, you know, that's who we are. Um, and, you know, taking the mentality of just taking a small company, like a boat company, just to make money off of just at the end of the day, it's not really going to work, um, to be frank. That was Sean Hargrave describing the essence of Boulder Boat Works. Another good one as we continue the drift boat season on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Uh, if you can, head over to wetflyswing.com slash Facebook and join our little community where you can ask questions from upcoming guests or just uh, see what's going on in the group. It'd be great to connect with you there. Sean Hargrave, one of the owners of Boulder Boat Works, shares the story and background of the unique polymer hole drift boat they produce. We find out why some of their clients love the line uh, on the boat uh, why they have an NRS framed uh, drift boat model, and uh, and then we dig into the river skiff. Uh, lots of stuff to hear today. A lot of background, some good stuff. So I'm excited to dive deeper down the uh, drift boat hole with you. So without further ado, here is Sean Hargrave from BoulderBoatWorks.com. How's it going, Sean? I'm great. How are you this morning, Dave? Great. Great to, great to have you on here. I'm excited to jump into this because uh, you guys have a, a cool boat. We're, we're continuing the, uh, the drift boat season, this, uh, this season we have going here. So I'm excited. You guys have a little bit different take on, I think, what I think of as the drift boat. So I'm, I'm fired up to hear that. But um, before we get there, just talk about how do you get into the whole the boat business and, and kind of that, that space? Uh, it's a good question. Um... You know, we, um, Bold Boat Works has been around for 20 years, 20 plus years, kind of, if you go to the conceptual stages, um, in the late nineties, uh, gentleman and, you know, friend today, uh, by the name of Andy Tui started tinkering, tinkering around with different materials, um, to land on what he thought could be a better boat, you know, drift boat for the water and, you know, kind of continuing to push the envelope, uh, in regards to materials. Um, Andy was a, um, a custom furniture manufacturing by trade at the time and an avid outdoorsman. And if you ask him, he's a, a hard charging hippie, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, kind of an interesting classic Colorado profile, you know, really laid back, but has always enjoyed the outdoors and he was a, uh, a wood boat, uh, drift boat kind of guy at the time. Um, and was sick of, you know, the maintenance required to work on wood. Um, but loved, you know, the attitude of the boat, uh, the wood boat in the water and how it felt as well as the aesthetics. So, um, you know, over, you know, multiple cups of coffee and a lot of pressing from a good group of friends, uh, in Boulder, Colorado at the time. And he kind of set out to, um, you know, see what other materials were viable. And, um, after a few years, you know, and a few different iterations and prototypes, uh, landed on, you know, a polymer hole, um, which still stands today, same material that we use today. Um, and then outfitted on the interior with, you know, some different woods at the time he was using, uh, a few different pines, um, and eventually involved into, we're primarily using white ash on the interior, which, um, you know, is aesthetically pleasing on the eye, uh, kind of has that classic, you know, boat look and appeal, but also, um, a lot of that wood is comes into the function how that boat feels on the water. And, and you know, it's like, you know, smooth nature and, um, you know, just feels like a, a, a wood boat and it's lightweight. Um, so Andy did that. Um, we can dive into some of the stories of the early days with Andy. There's a lot of good ones. Um, you know, but if we fast forward a little bit to answer your question about how I became involved and, you know, the, uh, my partners, um, you know, 17 years down the road, um, there was an opportunity, Boulder boats were for sale and we took advantage of the opportunity to, to kind of pick up the torch and carry it on from, from the work Andy had done. Um, you know, at the start, uh, I had been, I have a cousin by the name of Dan McMahon, who's been a guide in the Roaring Fork Valley for 13 years. And, 
uh, his road to Boulder. Um, so that was my first introduction to the product. So well in advance of us, you know, coming in and, um, you know, making the acquisition, we were familiar with the product. Uh, I was familiar with the product, you know, in love with it, in love with boats and fishing in general. Um, so when the opportunity presented itself and my background has been, you know, in advance of that was corporate finance, you know, evolved into manufacturing and evolved actually into plastics, material manufacturing. So it just made all the sense in the world to, to jump on the opportunity to come and operate a boat company and kind of marry, you know, my, my weekend and time off passions, uh, with work. So now, you know, we're, boat builders and boat geeks and doing what we love, you know, every single day. And we're going to be doing it for the next, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, you know, so that's where we're at today. Well, yeah. what is the polymer hole? Describe that. How's that different from just say wood or fiberglass? Sure. So, uh, it's a high density polyethylene. Uh, we make everything from sheet stock. Um, there's no, so we take a lot of weight out of that and it's very minimalist, uh, in that nature. And, uh, the polymer essentially strips, about 200 pounds of weight, two to 300 pounds, you know, generally speaking of weight, you know, from your, your classic fiberglass boat. Um, so you have a very lightweight sporty feel to the boat. Uh, but it also is wildly durable, uh, and it doesn't need any of the downstream maintenance that some other materials, are, uh, require. So to kind of reference some of the pros, you know, a big pro is it being lightweight. It doesn't draft a whole lot of water. I mean, we're drafting, you know, a few three to four inches in the Dory profile and in our new skiff profile, we're either, uh, we're even an inch lower than that. So you're riding up really high in the water column, which obviously has, you know, a lot of, uh, advantages, you know, in navigating certain rivers. Um, it opens up certain sections of the rivers that other boats can't go to. Um, but when it does encounter a rock and actually something we always push, you know, if somebody wants to come out and demo a boat, or if they hop in a boat with me, um, I make sure that they have to hit a rock because, um, it's just eye opening and it's hard to de describe, you know, in words or over a conversation. But when you, when you do hit a rock, the polymer has just a little bit of flex, but it's, it's very slick and it just slides quietly over that rock. So two things there, obviously a you know, no noise, uh, you know, when you're approaching a specific fishing line is important to, you know, your success, right? There's so many factors that go into it. And if we can mitigate noise from that equation, you know, it's going to help you, uh, you know, fish more effectively, you know, it opens, you know, guys, there's, you can run the boulder boat into certain sections of the river where rafts and other hard boats can't go. So it kind of opens up a little opportunity for you and, you know, how you want to fish a specific river. Um, but then, uh, you know, the big part of it is you just can't beat it up. You know, it doesn't chip, you know, and it doesn't leave, you know, a gel coat stain behind on that rock, you know, when you go past it. So, you know, there's probably some environmental advantages to that, but more importantly, there's just no downstream maintenance to it, right? You can't hurt that boat. So, um, you know, it just gives you a lot of confidence when you're on the sticks, you know, and it gives, it's a great boat for somebody to come in entry level, you know, because you can't bang up the boat, you know, as long as you point it straight and don't tee that rock up. Yeah, exactly. What happens if you run into, say, you're on in some white water and you run, you know, real hard into a rock, like into the, the side of the, you know, the, is there, I mean, is there a chance, do people put holes in those, in those things sometimes? So we, we never get a hole, uh, in the boat per se, but if you, you know, tee something up sideways, white water, yeah. you know, and you put a, a shiner in that boat. Um, essentially what it's going to do is just create, you know, a little curly cue or a little chip of the plastic and to repair that, or, uh, you know, all you have to do in the interim is just, you know, I'll just take a pocket knife out and just cut off if there's any little like sharp barbs or anything on that plastic. Um, just so it isn't a line catch, you know, for the future. Yeah. Um, that boat's going to perform the exact same way it does, um, you know, the next day or the next year. But if you ever got it to the shop to repair that, it's just like repairing the base of a ski, right? We're just taking a little of that polymer, uh, uh into like a molten state with a gun, filling that gap in, hmm. shaving it down. Um, and you know, in about the amount of time it would take you to drink a beer, you know, yeah. hanging out of the shop with us, you know, the guys can have that all cleaned up and, um, oh, wow. you know, ready, to, ready to rock. So there's, not much to it. And that's all under warranty and gotcha. Okay. So that's, so that's a big advantage is that it's, it's durable. I mean, if you compare it to say the other, 
you know, boats, obviously, you know, aluminum, there's fiberglass, there's wood, um, you know, and I guess mm-hmm. there's the polymer. Are there, are there any other types of uh, drift boats or that are made out of different products or is that it? Um, four? that's it. There's a few other polymer boats out there that, you know, approach the manufacturing a little bit differently than we do. Um, you know, uh, like rotomolding molding, um, that adds some more weight and might have some advantages and probably is a little bit, you know, um, different application specific. Um, but you know, by and large, you know, the way that we're doing it, you know, just taking them from, you know, sheet stock and, um, really getting, you know, crafting a boat, you know, what the guys do at the shop, you know, they are craftsmen. Um, you know, we're the only ones that are doing that right now. Um, you know, down the line, we think it's obviously, and I think there's a lot of people that, you know, can attest to it, you know, from professional guides to recreational anglers, you know, that it's a great boat and, Um, you know, I think we're by and large the only ones doing it right now. Um, but, uh, yeah. And so we, we, we make a product we believe in and that's that. When you look at the boat, it has the internal framework is, you know, mostly wood, but I have seen a couple, I think there was like aluminum. It looked like there was almost like the NRS style, uh, frame. Um, can you talk about the internal, like why, why wood? Why not, why not all plastic? Why do you have the, because that, that will eventually wear out, right? Or will it? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, the wood um, is definitely a point that can degradate, right? You know, we coat it with an epoxy, you know, marine grade epoxy uh, and varnish. You know, we're putting on, you know, uh, five to seven coats, you know, depending on, uh, you know, what wood pack we're going with to create, make it as bomb proof as possible. But it could require some maintenance down the line. Um, some people are cool with that. You know, some guys like having a little project, you know, it's also easy for us to maintain, um, you know, back at the shop, but you know, the wood, even though it's going to have to be refinished at times, you know, it's not going to break down. We had a boat in the shop the other day, Kirk Gamble's boat out of Missoula, Montana, you know, that's 15 years old. He's never done anything to his wood. He brought it in and we just, you know, popped his gunnels out and, you know, refinished his wood pack for him. And, you know, that was the only yeah. maintenance he's had to do on his wood pack in 15 years. You know, I know other guys like John Way and Ennis, he enjoys, you know, a spring project pop, you know, every spring he probably grabs a case of beer and a couple saw sawhorses and, you know, pops his gunnels off and he, he likes doing that. Gotcha. So there's a little, there's a little maintenance, a little bit of maintenance there, which sounds like, but not, not too big of a deal. That's why I was interested because, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, aluminum, for example, right? It's the other one. I mean, you could like set aluminum yep. outside and just, it can sit there for like 20 years and it wouldn't matter. You know, I mean, the, the trailer, if it had steel would rust away, but the aluminum would be fine. It sounds like this is similar in that you, you could kind of leave, do people leave their boats outside or is that something that you, you probably shouldn't do? Um, you know, we would recommend that you put it covered, uh, if you're going to leave it outside, but people do. And, and honestly, um, uh, you know, this is a big part of our, you know, process and conversations we have with customers, you know, in advance of making a boat for them. Cause if we're building a boat that's going to last you, I mean, these boats last you 20 plus years, you know, they don't, they don't die. Um, so we'll dive in with a customer and say, let's have a frank discussion about what level of maintenance you want, um, what you're actually going to do. And then we can dial into the right wood pack for you because we can also line X the wood, you know, just like the bed of a truck. Um, and a lot of guides, we, uh, yeah. you know, I find to gravitate towards that because they like the wood. You know, our, our gunnels are always going to stay white ash because um, the way that it gives that boat whole its shape uh, and having a, a, a material in there that isn't stagnant, and has a little bit of movement, you know, really factors into the, the process uh, and the feel of that boat. Uh, but if we, if, you know, I talked, uh, we sent three boats to these new skiffs up to Missoula to Joe Sowerby and Dave Huffman and Drew Miller up there who are all friends of the company and all of them to T were, you know, no maintenance. I don't want anything to do. So we just, you know, murdered it out with black line X on all the wood and it's a great looking boat. Yeah. You know, there's some people that dig the black against, you know, our beige polymer, um, you know, aesthetically speaking. So, um, you know, it's all the process, you know, that makes the job really fun. And what we do really fun is, 
each boat is unique, you know, to the person that's buying that boat, you know, the, the professional guide or the recreational angler. And, um, you know, before we dial in on what your wood pack is and what your interior configuration is, you know, we really want to dive into where you're fishing, who you're fishing with, you know, what do you, you know, some guys are project guys and boat geeks. You know, I was just with this guy, Galen Kapar out of, uh, Asheville that is just a boat geek, loves to tinker at all times, you know, so he wants a project to have. And, you know, so he's willing to have more wood and, you know, different things on his boat to kind of outfit it. He likes the NRS frame because, you know, it's very tinkerable. That was the thing, the NRS frame. So I, I saw, I, I think, a, mm-hmm. photos out there. So, so is the NRS frame? Des- describe that. You know, uh, l- let's 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 describe that first, and then we'll jump into the skiff versus the drift boat. So, so what is why why NRS frame, and and what does that look like? Yeah. So actually, the NRS frame came into play in 2008, uh, which we all know what was going on in the state of the economy in 2008. So Andy had set out to find where he could strip out cost in a boat um you know and at the same time kind of the byproduct of that is really stripped out maintenance from the boat as well um and he landed on if we just put an nrs frame into the hole we didn't lose any of you know the boulder feel you know that boat when you're on the sticks rose identically to a boat with you know the wood frame yeah. interior and that's been a major objective you know for that boat you know in 2008 then also with our skiff you know we want that boat to feel like a boulder boat you know we want it to be quick and agile and maneuverable you know things that people have you know kind of tagged as synonymous with the brand when they're on a boulder and why they really enjoy the boats and so whenever we're making these changes and iterations, you know, having that boulder feel is really important to us. Um, and we can't lose that for, you know, interior options and, uh, you know, fishability on the interior. And uh, when we put that NRS frame in it, you know, it rose identically. Um, that boat, you know, kind of sticker price, you know, we're stripping, you know, a couple thousand bucks oh, wow. out of that boat, which wow. is a, a, a gotcha. big advantage. And it's, so it's basically you save a ton of money on that, that style. Totally, totally. And gotcha. it just gives us more options to be available and and for as many people as possible, right? So you still, if I wanted to pick up a new boat today, I could get a boat with an NRS uh, frame in the inside. You bet. Yeah, that's what we call our guide series. Our guide series. So you can that's get awesome. uh, a high side or a low side, our Dory profile. Then if you move to the interior, it's either a guide, which is the NRS interior configuration, or a pro guide. Yeah. which is kind of our wood pimped out, I see. you know, um, classic look. What percentage, uh, you know, like the the frame, the NRS frame versus the wood, uh, you know, as far as sell, s- sales? Because I'm curious, because for me, you know, obviously money is a big part of it, but you'd think your boat is all about mm-hmm. looking amazing. It looks, when you first see it, it almost, you think it's a wood boat. You think it's a wood boat that's painted, um, you know, mm-hmm. with your color if you didn't know it. But you know, so what is the percentage? So, so do you guys sell quite a few of those aluminum or is it mostly the wood? You know, um, it's not a, by any means a 50, 50 split. I would say 20% of the, the Dory profiles that we make go with the guide, uh, series, the aluminum, we probably quote the aluminum. Yeah. Um, we probably quote 50% of our quotes that go out, you know, people start thinking about the guide, but then yeah. when they start to, to go through the iterations and they look at pictures and, you know, we're, we're going through this process, it's generally, you know, a few months of continued conversations. Um, we get a lot of people that at the end of the day say, you know what, I just love the look of that wood and I'm going to exactly. splurge and I'm treat gonna, myself. <laughs> if you're already spent, I'm not sure what your boats are, but yeah, I mean, you're spending eight, yeah. eight, ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. It's like, well, I think I could uh, find the other two grand to, to have the wood. Yeah. 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 That's but cool. It's, but it's also really nice for us you know we see a lot of you know professional guides where we know cash is you know tight and money's tight but they want to be in a boulder and we've had a lot of scenarios where they'll buy a guide as their first boat and the nice thing about these boats just because people know the longevity of them they have pretty good retain value so they know a few years down the road they can resell that boat for uh, in times you know depending on if you maintain your boat and keep it up you know damn near what they paid for it and then go into the upgrade, you know, and it's nice that that, that guide boat that got them going, they can find a good home for it, you know, and somebody else that can, you know, continue to run it. People that know they buy it used, they know they're, they're reputationally kind of bomb proof and, yeah. you know, then they 
to take that step that's up. That's right. That's right. Yeah. No. And I and I love the NRS. I I've actually had an NRS frame. I, I have some you know rafts over the years. So I, I know the the beauty about NRS is you know personal experience for me. I mean, I remember when I was putting my frame together. They their service is awesome. I mean, they customize this frame to be a. a you know, a fly fishing frame and it was like a, a, some special little tweak. So I think, I think they're a great company that just makes sense that you would be, you know, you guys would be working with other good companies. So, um, Hey, I want to check, you know, on this because I want to tie in uh, Boulder boats to kind of more of that history. I'm not sure how much you know of this, but you know, for Andy going back, you know, 20 plus years when he started, do you know, well, I guess, first of all, is it, do you know if it's like a McKenzie style boat or a rogue style? Because I think the two drift boats always go back to, right, whether they have a more rocker or if they have a flat section on the bottom. Do, do you know about that? I do. Yeah, it is a McKenzie Dory. So it's McKenzie, uh, so it's it a lot of rocker, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, so, yep. so you got the McKenzie style, which I, I recently did an episode with um, Roger Fletcher, who broke down a lot of the history. He wrote a book on drift boats and dories. And yeah, we talked a little bit about this. And it's interesting to me because you have the whole Colorado, you know, Grand Canyon boats, those dories. And, you know, you got you hear dories and you hear drift boats and river skiff. And if you search if you search on Google, you know, by far uh, drift boat, <laughs> drift boat comes up more. Right. I mean, dory barely even comes up and then like a river dory. And then but the river skiff is something that comes up a little bit. Can you can you talk maybe talk first about that? Why not? Uh, why are you guys called boater uh, boulder boat works, not boulder boats or boulder drift boats or boulder skiffs? Yeah, it's a good question. So. The skiff, which, you know, I, I, it could probably be debated if you want to get boat geeky that it's closer to a river pram than a skiff. But a lot of people, you know, in advance of us, um, you know, have skiff has kind of been the term that has been been tagged on, um, you know, a river boat that has a squared off front, uh, low rocker profile and is really built to mitigate wind in less gradient rivers right so you get on the plains rivers and you get into the northern rockies and out to the southeast and the midwest and even the western slope of colorado um if you don't have significant gradient water to navigate um you know it's a luxury to be able to drop some of that sidewall uh lower the rocker profile so you have a long lean wet line that's going to keep your chine engaged just to combat, you know, the wind that it's a bigger issue than, you know, necessarily keeping anglers dry and water out of the boat. Uh, if you're, which is a little bit more of, you know, the challenge when you're, you know, in a Colorado, you know, high up in the mountain, you know, gradient river with more significant water to navigate. So, um, you know, we set out, you know, after in 2017 happened, you know, we got a chance. We're, we're big believer in voice of the customer, right? We're a community, you know, we're a small little company and we lean on good partners like you referenced before, you know, NRS and a variety of other professional services. But a big part of what we lean on too is, you know, the Boulder community, the guys that are rowing the boat, you know, the, the pros that are out there, you know, the recreational anglers that have been doing this for 20 years, you know, the prospective customers and just anybody that's fishing in general. And honestly, if anybody just wants to talk boats and geek out, you know, we, those are the people that we gravitate towards, you know, cause that's who we are, um, as a company. And, um, you know, just relatively quickly after us coming on, we, we felt that there is a pretty significant appetite, um, for, people wanting a river skiff, a skiff profile with a boulder material. Uh, and it's something that uh, has kind of been a drumbeat from a lot of the pro- professional guides who were boulder guys up in Montana, um, you know, in advance of us coming on, you know, so as I got acquainted with them and us coming in, we just determined that, you know, it's what's next for us. And um, we, we really want to keep the the pedal to the metal on the R&D side. It's fun to build new boats. It's fun to always have another project. And that was one that just felt like it had a big strike zone for us. So, yep. um, that's cool. you know, in, in 2018, you know, we were ready for it. We had a year of, you know, conversations and we were just, you know, ready to, to, to take on a new boat. And, um, so we landed on, we had a skiff summit, you know, where we brought together, you know, a variety of, um, different professional guides. Uh, we actually brought Andy back in, you know, as a consultant to work on the project because, you know, we're big fans of history. Um, so it was a chance for us to get to work shoulder to shoulder with Andy. We felt like it was, you know, the best way to pass the torch, you know, and make sure that 
we heard all his war stories and all the jokes and all the funny things about, you know, the history of the company, just having that good transition, uh, you know, I think is a good business practice. Um, I also think that it's a little bit of a tip of the cap to, you know, the history of the company and all the hard work Andy put into it. So getting an opportunity to partner up with them and, uh, you know, our production leader now, Trevor uh, Hansen, he's also uh, one of my partners, um, you know, an owner in the company, um, you know, is just a, a phenomenally talented, um, you know, builder uh, in general. Um, so that him and Andy kind of ran point on a lot of the, you know, you know, the tactical, you know, I'm, I guess, more of the dreamer, for lack of a better word, you know, this is where we need to go. Where did the design come from? Where did the, you know, you've got this, uh, well, I guess there's two things. you got the skiff design and then you've got mm-hmm. the drift. I mean, where did that initial <clears throat> Andy's, you know, it sounds like it was the McKenzie style. Where, where did that design come from? You know, that Andy's design came from a lot of research and history on drift boats and going through, you know, the rogue options, the McKinsey options, um, you know, boats that he had worked on historically and just drawing on that history. And again, the voice of the customer and, you know, just honestly, it comes down to just labor intensive. Yeah. And you just need to make a bunch of prototypes. You know, there's nothing that beats, nothing that can replace building a hull, getting on the water, rowing it and feeling it. Yeah. And that's what you need to do. And that's honestly what we did with the skiff too. I mean, we started with a blank piece of paper and just tried to come to all the conclusions, you know, data dumped, you know, a bunch of a thoughts, you know, onto a white piece of paper, you know, of a good group of guys. And then when we felt that we were in a place that we were ready to build a boat, you know, you know, we had sketched it out, done all our, you know, geometry, you know, feeling, we just built a blank hole and essentially you're throwing milk crates, you know, instead of seats and everything on the interior configuration. Um, because before we worried about that, it's important to get that hole right. Um, and then we just get it on the water, we grow it, um, you know, for a couple weeks, uh, make a determination on what we want to see change. Um, you know, if it's a little tweak here, there, um, you know, a little bit more width here, you know, on, you know, in the, the front and the bow or, you know, taking the transom out a little bit more and maybe, you know, extending, you know, the, the, the width, you know, the beam, um, and just little tweaky things until, yeah. um, you know, we've made a few boats, we've rode them and then, we eventually got to a point, you know, this is with the skiff and uh, I'm sure how Andy approached it. I, I don't, you know, know I wasn't a part of that process. So I know that's, you know, just through conversation, how he approached it too. But, you know, you got to land on the hole first um, because that's the performance of the boat. That's what matters. You know, how's it eating waves? How does it ferry? Um, how does it feel? Um, you know, you know, weight wise. How, how do you, how does it feel if you're taking that thing down? It sounds like the great thing about that boat is that, that it, it does awesome in the wind, uh, much better than, mm-hmm. than a drift boat. So that's a great thing. I guess one thing is how, how does it feel, you know, if you're going down through some, a little bit of white water, does it, I mean, is there, how do you know what the level is? I mean, wh- how do you know when you're, you know, do you, has anybody gotten to a spot where you're like, wow, this white water's a little bit too big or how do you know? Yeah. The, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, it always comes down to comp- competence of the oarsman, right. Uh, and, and staying within yourself, uh, you know, to safely navigate the river. Um, you know, I think that's something that we try and press upon everybody and it's important to, you know, and it's cool, uh, to be, you know, a safe, competent oarsman and not, you know, getting out ahead of your skis. Um, but, uh, I will tell you this in that, uh, skiff, we do have a little bit more aggressive rocker profile in front of the four locks on that boat than any other skiff that oh, you'll you see in the market. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's made a little bit for white water, right? So, it, so you can go down through some yeah. stuff, some stuff. Yeah. It's like, I, I struggle with the term white water, but it's like, I mean, I, we've run it through class three, well, you know, in water. our local rivers. Yeah. yeah it's white, white water, water <laughs> you know? And yeah, it's like, I'm taking the cheater yeah. line probably and trying to stay as safe as possible. It's interesting because this skiff goes back to, if you look again, the history of drift boats when they first started back in the Mm -hmm. 20s, those boats didn't have a point, right? The bow was flat, just like your skiff. So it's like the transition, the transition turned into a point. I can't remember the historic, the guy that did it, but he transferred that in. And you guys still have one of those. Prince Helfridge. Yeah. Well, I think it was, well, what happened was Helfridge um, was on the river uh, one day. Prince Helfridge was on the river and this guy floats down in this boat that had a point. Or, or no, I think it just handled, right. yeah, right. It handled yeah. well. And he was like, yeah. I need to talk to that guy. I can't remember his name, but I'll, I'll put a link to that, to that episode. 
But um, but you guys have the skiff. Uh, so why why the flat? Why not why not putting a point on the skiff? You know the thing I like most about that flat front is it opens up so much real estate on the interior of that boat. You know, it makes it the interior fishability. I mean, and again, also going to a big objective and advantage, you know, not only do you want to mitigate wind in the skiff, but if you don't come to that pronounced bow in the front, we got a little bit more width in the transom, you know, you don't have the aggressive angles on your gunnels and that just makes it all usable space on the interior of that boat. And it, that much all more right. comfortable to fish out of that much more comfortable gotcha. to outfit and give you options. And, you know, I was with, I was fishing on the South Holston yesterday with my, uh, buddy Galen, um, Kapar and, you know, he defined it like, he's like, I feel like I'm driving one of those old Cadillacs with the, the crazy yep. long hood, you Love know, you those. just lean back and it just, even though it's still a 16 foot boat, you know, just like yeah. our Dory profile, it is, it's just, you know, illusion, optical illusion. It just feels really long. Um, but it has really clean, uh, you know, line of sight too, when, yeah. if you're not coming to that pointed bow and have the high side, so you can really see that river. And, you know, when you're on the sticks, you know, you can really see the substrate, you know, and, and understand, you know, where, you know, there's a trough over there and we're going to go and hiss, hit that and fish that. And it just, yeah. it makes it much more fishable boat. So it sounds like there's a few big things that make it a, really a great boat, but it's maneuverable. So, you know, you have that. It's uh, It does well in the wind. The low sides probably is great because landing fish and stuff like that. Um, Absolutely. I mean, what, what else would you add to that list? Like the, the great features, you know, benefits of this, of this boat, the skiff versus, say, a drift boat. For sure. So kind of going top down, you know, two huge objectives for us on this boat was getting to a full walk around design. All right. Uh, if somebody wants that, you know, so we can go pedestal at all three seats. That's awesome. Um, you know, or you can still put a bench in the oarsman. If you like more storage on the interior, you're fine popping over a bench. Um, you know, because if you go to pedestal, yeah. you're stripping out a lot of dry storage. Can you change that out? Or is that what the NRS is for? You can actually change out a pedestal or a, a, a storage seat and stuff like that. You know, as it pertains to you know, those that's more on the manufacturer level. Oh, okay. gotcha. uh, it, it'd be tough. Like if you go with the bench on the interior, it'd be tough to retrofit that to a full walk around boat. Oh, I but, see. Yeah. Um, I will say this, another major objective on this boat for us is we wanted to make this boat as modular as possible. So we also came, put in new rod trays, but that rod tray is very easily taken in and out of that boat. So if you wanted your rod tray and say you're a guide, you know, out of, out of Bozeman, right. You know, and you're fishing the, the Yellowstone, you know, 200 days a year, but you go and do a Smith river trip, you know, which is, you know, you and a buddy or you and the wife or, or whatever it is, you know, that rod tray could come out if you wanted more of that space and that real estate on the interior in order to pack that boat out. Um, same goes with the casting braces, you know, all the casting braces come in and out. And honestly, if, if you want to buy a boat and, you know, I know, some some guides up in the northern rockies you know their anglers sit down every day so if you don't want to buy a casting brace and have it in the boat you know to even you know give the temptation or another place to you know for an angler sitting down to wrap their knuckles on or anything like that you know so point being is that we wanted to be able to say yes to as many questions as possible um when we took this you know project on so that we can really dive into and outfit a boat specific to an individual's needs, wants, you know, style. Um, and, and that was just a, a major overarching objective when we took this on. So we have a few rod storage options. Um, we have a few, you know, interior configuration and dry storage versus cooler options. Um, we have a few different, um, you know, casting brace options. So it just makes it fun. You know, when somebody's buying a boat that's going to last for the next 20 years, it's really important to us that we dive into all the minute details and you know how it is as a angler, right? You know, all the little finicky stuff and the extra place, you know, of like where your net's going to sit, um, you know, where your boat bag's going to fit. And, uh, you know, you just want that stuff dialed. And, yeah. Yeah. Storage, um, is, storage it's an, is huge. Yeah. And so we know we're selling somebody a boat, you know, for that's going to last them, you know, a lifetime or, you know, 20 years or whatever it is. And we just want to get it right on the first pass for them. And a cool part about our process too, is that we're not constrained to a mold. 
So, you know, if you want a couple extra inches in your dry storage in the back or, you know, you're a musky guy and, you know, you have larger arbor reels, um, you know, we need to figure out something that's going to fit your program. We're able to make those tweaks, you know, on everybody's boat, you know, as long as they work within, you know, our quality constraints, you know, we're always going to want to make sure that if we make something, you know, a part or feature that it's going to stack up to the longevity oh, cool. of the whole. Gotcha. Can you customize the the boat? Can you actually, you know, the design of the boat? Do you guys do that? Like the well, one example is like the decking. Have you guys ever done any of the, the decked over drift boats? We have. Um, we haven't built one in a while, but Andy built. Uh, he calls them the DC ten, and he built a, a series of boats that was a deck dory. You know, made for you know overnight whitewater trips. You know, Grand Canyon. Uh, you know, and the like. Um, so they're out there, you know, yeah. we've been, it's definitely a, a project boat we have on the radar. I think we'll, we'll probably build one just because we want to, we want to row it ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Have you been down Sometime. the Grand Canyon or is that something on your, your... I unfortunately haven't, you know, yeah. I've been, uh, it's been, it's probably yeah. top of my bucket list right now. Uh, I know. And I, you know, it's, uh, fascinating. That's been the most exciting. One of the exciting things about doing this drift boat series is I've, you know, been re researching that and those boats, it's, you know, it's intense. I mean, the, the, but the crazy thing is, right. I mean, even the boats you have, you know, you flip those boats over, dump them, they're, they're sinking. Um, but these decked over boats, it's crazy, right? They flip over and they're floating down river and then you just turn them, <laughs> flip yeah. them back up, which your boat would be awesome for it because the polymer, you could bang into stuff and it'd probably be okay. Yeah, absolutely. And the polymer has a natural buoyancy. So it's like, not only is it on the scale light, you know, but that natural buoyancy want to raise to the top of the water column because, you know, the properties of polymer versus water, you know, makes it very buoyant. And really, we haven't had any boat that's ever sank and been put out of commission. You know, we've pulled them off pylons and stuff like that. And we can always bring them back to life, uh, you gotcha. know, with a few welds and different things. And so I just think that, yeah, it, it's going to do well, you know, if we get back into that deck dory for them and then uh, you know we can <laughs> yeah. feed our personal appetite to to start to take on different water and it's just it's just fun to be on the river and the different set of challenges and a different adventure you know going out you know running those type of trips you know versus versus fishing and they're all good you just want to do them all <laughs> yeah totally totally so i want to go back to that mckenzie the dory and stuff like that so it sounds like maybe you don't have the whole history there but andy did he have so he didn't really have a mentor i mean he just kind of started out like had a drift boat you know in in the back lot and kind of started designing something off of that or i'm just trying to get to that historic piece like where you know how could we tie like when i was um talking to coffler who has an aluminum boat um you know and they you know, they're eventually, I guess they start in the 80s, 70s, 80s, but their boat came from, I think it was the Jerry Briggs style, right? It was a certain connection. Is Andy, I guess it's, it's such a later, you don't really have that connection to some of the older boats? Yeah, you know, I've, you know, I've, I've talked to Andy ad nauseum, um, you know, about all kinds of things about the start of the company. It's never really came up of a specific individual um, that I think drove the mentorship for him. Andy, a lot like me, is also an avid reader and fan of history. So I think a lot of it just came from, you know, from my understanding, just diving into boat building books. And, you know, the thing about boats is no matter what we do, it's rare that you're going to do something original. You know, people have, you know, mankind has been making boats for, you know, thousands of years. And, you know, even though you come to the pronounced bow now, you know, or a different shape now, it's like the likelihood of it be do being done historically uh, is pretty high. Um, so, you know, from, you know, I think he just dove into, you know, different books and, you know, he, things that he'd liked, you know, he'd been rowing boats for years, you know, as an angler. And, you know, he's just like I am, too. It's like every time you're in a boat, you're looking around and thinking of tinkering and doing something different and here or there and, you know, just always having your mind wrapped around that boat and what's different and asking you know, questions to people, um, you know, about what they like about something or don't like, and, you know, seeing how that boat performs, you know, in, you know, whitewater in Colorado and how that's going to transition to, you know, you know, big heavy water and, and different hydraulics up in Montana. And it's just kind of a lifestyle more than anything. Um, and just trying to, you know, constantly keep your, um, eyes on the water and the boat and how it performs with it and letting that drive, you know, the tweaks and changes. And, you know, I think that that's probably the most accurate way to define how Andy went about it 
and it's the the way to define how we go about it too um today yeah 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 and, and andy i'm not sure the transition there i i did i was i was on when i was doing a little research i came across this person it was kind of strange because i was looking up uh, boulder boats in this robert hirsch podcast it wasn't even a podcast it was like a little snippet um and robert hirsch came up and he was talking about how he it was uh it was the freedom factories podcast and he was talking about he was a part owner for like like a year i basically it sounded like he flipped boulder boats like he bought it and he ch- do, do you know that history like what, what happened there i do yeah I'm, oh because we bought the company from robert oh okay um, yeah you know but yeah, okay. it was but the thing is and honestly that was really what drove us bringing andy in to, to help on the skiff because it was a year long and you know i don't it, it just wasn't very significant you know there wasn't a lot that happened during that era that was significant that's the interesting thing about him is that about Robert is that he said he basically said, "Hey, um, I came in here to change the boat." He he made the he it sounds like he's a big just a business person, and he said, "Yeah, he changed the boat from or the company from um, uh, what was it like having a job versus you know being uh, you know basically he said he just went in there to make money off of it and, and he sold it. Sounds like you know he, he obviously he had a good product, which is Boulder Boats is a great product, but." Yeah, it, it sounds like that's cool. So yeah, fill us in on on that how you guys got that the trade off from Robert. Yeah, you know, um, so uh, Robert's local in Colorado, and that's honestly where we heard that the company was for sale. Um, I do think there's something to be said about understanding and operating small companies. It's wildly important that ownership is heavily involved in the day to day operations. It's just that's what small companies are you know, and, and and taking the mentality of just hiring out, you know, who's going to operate and run it for you just doesn't seem to work. And it's just not our approach. Um, and you know, when you're in a small company, um, you know, the, the thing that's fortunate about where we're at today is, you know, we live and breathe this company, you know, and, and we need to, um, you know, get in there every day and operate, you know, to put food on the table, um, for us. And we take, you know, the guys that work for us, you know, we're, we're a family, you know, we're a team. Uh, we take a lot of pride being a small business owner and, um, you know, giving substantial, you know, places for good people to work. Um, we're going to take pride and, if we, you know, play our cards right and do the right thing that next year, you know, maybe we got two more trucks in the parking lot. Um, and as a small business owner, you know, that's who we are. Um, and, you know, taking the mentality of just taking a small company, like a boat company, just to make money off of, yeah. just at the end of the day, it's not really going to work. Doesn't feel, um, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. No. And I, yeah. I love that you say that because I think it, it just, it, when I heard that, I was like, "Yeah, this is kind of strange." And then you describing it there makes total sense. I think that, um, you know, the small kind. I've talked to a lot of them, right? I mean, now we've got tons of episodes here. I mean, like Tom Morgan, Rod Smiths comes to mind when I talk to them. They said the same thing. You know, I mean, they're, you know, they're part of the company. They're not. They're not outsourcing. You know, their their stuff, right? And that's the same for you guys. The owners are part of the the building and the process. Yeah, you know. The owner in our scenario still helps clean the bathrooms. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, pushes the broom, That's you know, awesome. whatever you got to do to make it happen. And we consider ourselves so fortunate to be able to work in such a cool industry and lifestyle and, and call it, you know, our career and building boats. You know, that's as much the for me, compensation, you know, isn't just monetary, no. you know, it's who you Lifestyle. get to work with, where you get to work, you know, who you get to interact with, who you get to sell things to, you know, that all factors into quality of life. And, um, we build boats that we're proud of. Uh, we put our heart and soul into it every day. And, it, and it's, it, it's not just a business, it's a lifestyle. And we take a lot of pride in what we do. And we think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, we're, you know, to, to use kind of a generic term, but it's just kind of that like heartbeat of America, you know, we're, you know, all of us, you know, the current owners are from Iowa, you know, I think we pride ourselves in hardworking, you know, we all have manufacturing oh, cool. backgrounds, cool. um, you know, Southeastern Iowa is a pretty huge manufacturing hub and community. Who are the other owners out there with you? Yeah. So I got two partners. I have Trevor, uh, who runs the operation every day. And then our third partner is Tim McMahon. Who's oh, yeah, actually Tim. my uncle. Yep. Oh, cool. Um, cool. 
So grew up around him. He was always a professional mentor, um, big outdoors mentor too. You know, we always, we've been fishing and hunting together for, you know, since I was a little kid. I mean, he was, I remember him teaching me how to, you know, cast a fly rod when I was probably 10 years old, you know, in his backyard. Nice. Uh, um, you know, and that's kind of where that journey started for me. Gotcha. Um, and you know, he, he and I have always, you know, been in stride, you know, I always lean on him heavily, you know, through my, you know, the other steps of my professional career, like I said, I started in, you know, corporate finance and moved to, you know, my first, you know, entrepreneurial venture buying, uh, a company that manufactured, you know, polymer, uh, roofing material. Um, oh, wow. so we've always just, known how each other works. The nice thing about, you know, our relationship is generally our meetings last five to 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're generally on the same page for everything. Tim's more of just a advisory role. He actually calls himself the shoulder crow. You know, he comes in, takes a look around, kind of takes a, a dump on your shoulder and then leaves, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it tells you what you're doing wrong or right. But you know, it, it, it's kind of our, our running joke around the shop, but he's just a really good manufacturing mind, uh, and a great person to, you know, also has a pretty good commercial acumen, uh, with his history in manufacturing. So, you know, it's nice to be able to have that somebody that, you know, we can take a step back, bounce some ideas off, say, you know, Hey, these are the five things that are on our radar right now. I'm thinking this, this, and this, we, you know, we kind of check, we both agree on that, both agree on that, disagree on, you know, how we're approaching, you know, this, you know, specific problem. So we'll talk it out, come to a good resolution. Then it's on Trevor and I to go out and execute, um, the day to day. Yeah, so that's cool. So he's kind of the, yeah. he's got some of that knowledge. I, I compare it to, again, some of these other companies I've talked to that are, it sounds like a similar deal. You've got this guy, uh, the one that comes to mind is OPST. That's more, you know, kind of like in the spay game and stuff, but they have, you know, Ed Ward was this big spay caster that uh, oh, yeah. started the company, right? You know, Ed, and and he just sits back in the back, right? He's like the, you know, he's like this, uh, the grandfather, just, you know, everything gets run by him, but you don't hear from him. You can't even talk to him barely, but he, yeah. but, he but he's the man. Is that kind of how Tim is for you guys? It is. You know, I was actually, as soon as you bring this up, I was talking to my girlfriend this weekend about like, how do you learn, you know, what is it in your life, you know, education wise, you know, what forum, you know really resonates with you. And for me, it's always been mentorship. Yeah. Like more than reading a textbook or anything like aligning with good people, you know, that you value their opinion. They're generally older than you, you know, they've gone through the things I learn really well from those types of scenarios. And I've gravitated to those historically. I mean, I even pride myself now and having some people that look up to me, you know, and I can help along sure. the way. Um, I also think that that's very authentic to, you know, outdoor pursuits, you know, we all have our mentors, um, you know, and some of us are fortunate enough to start to have mentees where you pass things down word of mouth. Um, and it's just nice to have, you know, that person, you know, as an advocate now, you know, professionally aligned with me now because I've leaned on his advice for a long time. So I've been shaped, uh, you know, by a lot of his direction. So uh, it just makes it for a very smooth transition. Um, you know, we've been having, you know, professional conversations for a long time and um, he's great at that. Um, he's good like that with like, you know, Trevor as well. You know, Trevor and I have a you know, a very tight bond too, which is really necessary to kind of tie, you know, I cover the commercial end of the business. Oh, okay. Yeah. Trevor covers the uh, pr production. Oh, I so having good communication to be able to take what I'm seeing in the field, you know, feed it back in the factory, you know, then we lean on the boats and talk about what we can do different and better and, um, you know, what's working or not working. What do you guys do when you come to something where you don't agree? And maybe, I mean, have you guys ever butted heads where it's just like, I could see that that's the struggle with the partnership, right? Because there are some things where maybe you want to go around and somebody goes, have you guys had that ever happen? Not really, um, because we all have a pretty profound respect for each other. Mm -hmm. So there's never really any butting heads, but nice. there's plenty of disagreeing. Yeah. And, you know, that that stimulates great conversations. You know, that's like that's the core of how you solve problems um, and make sure that you're not looking, you know, I guess like you know, myopically through your own lens, like when you have other people, you're aligned with other people with good, credible opinions around you. You know, when you determine that you're seeing something, you know, two different ways, then you talk it out and come to, That's right. you know, either a resolution in the middle, or if I come to a determination where Trevor's right in this scenario, like I don't have an ego, like, you know, we, we just move on. 
Could you give us an example just to see, like, is there some design or some feature or something you guys have kind of disagreed on and then you kind of came to a, a consensus? Yeah, it's, you know, it's it, it's what we joke about all the time. You know, it's like Trevor, we always claim that, you know, Trevor wakes up in the middle of the night, you know, with, uh, you know, sweating with fear of like what I've agreed to, you know, and what we're going to do differently in the boat, <laughs> you know, um, because what it generally comes down to is, you know, you can take a lot of hypotheticals and great ideas, um, but then you need to layer on the manufacturing acumen and how that's going to be built, you know, how much it's going to cost to be built. Right. So, you know, does the, the cost benefit for a specific feature if, you yeah. know, might make a ton of sense if we can offer that feature for a hundred bucks, but if we're going to have to charge 500 bucks, cause that's what it's going to cost to make it, is it going to add value, $500 of value to the boat? You know, so, and then also uh, on top of that, you know, is it going to last? And that's where Trevor comes in, you know, he's like, I don't feel like we can comfortably make this part to last for 20 years. Um, so we're not going to do it, you know, and, and, and then we're going to go back to the customer and say, we're not going to do it. And this is why, because, you know, our reputation, our brand uh, is heavily predicated on, it's a hundred percent predicated on the quality of that boat, the longevity of that boat. You know, when somebody tasks us to build a boat for them, we're going to build them a boat that's going to last forever. And if we feel like we're putting a part of feature that's not going to stack up to that, um, we're not going to put it in there. And, um, you know, that's where kind of the Trevor and my dynamic kind of comes into play. And I really respect, you know, his insight, you know, on that, you know, when we throw ideas and I'll continue to push him on it. And it's like really important, you know, yeah. it's really important for us to have some little, you know, hanging hook for a net for the musky guys so they sure. can keep the musky net out of the way you know and you might tell me you don't want to make you know that because it's going to be a break point but sometimes you know we're going to need need to keep turning the flipping the coin over until we land on something that's going to keep that cockpit clean and that boat really fishable so um that's kind of how it works at a boat shop you know and we everybody has their lane and you know we have subject matter experts and you know, good partnership between Trevor and I, because I know that he has a good feeling for number, you know, the cost of materials and the amount of labor that would go into making something. And he knows that I have a really good feel for what the customer wants and what's going to make our boat bigger and better and, you know, more fishable. Um, so, you know, we just kind of work stride for stride. We talk about it, you know, ad nauseum every day. That's it. Yeah. You guys are around, you guys are around each other every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's so, cool. yeah, the best time at a boat shop is that first hour of the day with a cup of coffee, just leaning on the gunnels and talking about the different tweaks and, you know, what you could do different. And, yeah. You know, what can change. And that's just a fun moment to kind of geek out on boats. And it keeps us, you know, you know, relevant and looking towards the future and all that jazz. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and what is the, in the boater, the boulder, the boat works? What, where does it, where did that come from? Why, why boat works versus just boulder boats? You know, I think that, you know, that's probably a question for Andy. I've yeah. never asked him. I don't yeah. know. Maybe just he felt like it sounded a little bit more astute. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but I, I do think that, you know, the works does to me when I hear Boulder Boat Works or just Boulder Boats, it does lend a hand to it feels a little bit more like it's represents the craftsmanship that goes into our boats. I mean, we aren't a flow manufacturer, you know, we we are boat craftsmen, you know, and what these guys do every day, you know, isn't flow production. Like we're not, you know, putting on hazmat suits and just putting it, snapping a part in because that's how we've done it a hundred times over, you know, like, yeah. you know, the wood guys, you know, needs to, to watch his varnish as it lays down and make sure that we're, you know, every piece of wood's a little bit different and, right. you know, um, you the know, the grains shit. are a little bit different and it's like, you know, it's like we're craftsmen, you know, and it's, I think that there's some beauty and history in, you know, being a boat builder and we take that pretty seriously. I mean, I think it's cool to, you know, to read up on the guys, you know, boat rights that have been doing it, you know, in shipyards, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay for, you know, hundreds of years. I mean, you know, there's just something about being a boat builder that we all take pretty seriously. Um, I think that's pretty unique to our company and cool. And that's honestly why we always have our doors open to customers. Like, come on in check it out you know we love talking boats and people seeing the process you know yeah. it's you know pretty fun to watch it, it watch it go down that's um, cool so do you, do you throw when you think of your uh you know boulder the the boats do you think more uh, of your history and linear lineage and stuff more to like drift boats or just just boat builders in general 
I think it's drift boats. Um, yeah. you know, fishing is very, a, a very, you know, centric objective, uh, you know, fly fishing, you know, almost specifically, um, is very centric to our company and our brand and who we are historically. Yeah. It's who we are as individuals. It's what we do in boats, you know, 90% of the time. Um, I do think that we're passionate about rivers and we're interested and you look at the, what we're going to do in the next 30 years, you know, as boat geeks, our mind is always turning on other boats, other water, you know, it's just interesting to us, you know, it's fun to talk about, um, you know, but at our core, um, you know, we are, we are building, you know, you know, boats to be, you know, accommodate angling, you know, and, um, in large part, it's, it tends to be fly angling. Yeah, I'm not saying fly. that if a gear guy wants to run our boat, we'd love to outfit him for that gear boat. You know, if that's his thing, I mean, if you like getting on the water, you know, you're a good sportsman, you know, you're a conservationist. Um, you know, we don't, we, we don't care who's running our boat, but, um, you know, you're, um, you know, it just seems like that's kind of who gravitates towards boats. And that's generally, you know, the type of insight that we get from being on the water with the type of people that we're generally yeah. on the water with. That's, I think it's because, yeah, you guys are, I mean, I think of you more as a wood, you know, more as a wood boat. You know, it seems like a more of a, like a wood boat versus a, you know, a, a, aluminum or something else. So, And I think fly fishermen tend to resonate with that, right, more of the connection to the history. Um, do you know anybody else that has the name? You know, there's, there's you guys. Are there other um, boat companies that have the boat works that are drift boat companies in, in their name? Or are you guys the only ones? Uh, I think we're the only ones. Yeah, you're the only ones. Yeah, you're. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah. it, it works because when you hear it, I mean, that, that's what you think of as craftsmanship, right? I mean, that's what it feels yeah. like. It feels like these guys, are, they're doing something different. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. cool. Well, anything else we want to talk about? I mean, as far as we're going to get out of here pretty quick, but... Did we miss anything on models? I mean, you got the skiff, you got the you got the drift boat, which is your typical style. Um, you got the high side stuff. Uh, anything else we want to hit before we get out of here? No, I don't think so. I mean, the skiff's the big one for us. Um, we're pumped. It was forty percent of the boats we made last year. I mean, people are digging it, and that's really nice to see. You know, it all come to fruition after a couple of years of R and D. So, um, yeah, I think the skiff has been a ton of fun. And even if you look at, you know, what we've done in the last year of, you know, the fine tuning details, like that boat's dialed, you know, mm. it, it's a, it, it's a, it's a player. It's a great boat to fish cool. out of and we're super pumped on it. Can you throw a motor on it? You can, oh, uh, yeah. it's coast guard certified for up to a six horse. Okay. Um, yeah, we're working on some casting decks and things to dial it into some musky specific applications right now. And so you can take it lakes and stuff like that are also yeah, yeah. lakes or sneaky rivers you know with primitive boat launches and then having a good platform and rod storage you know to accommodate the different iterations for musky fishing so that's been fun and we think it's you know uh we're super jacked on um how dialed it is you know for the trout game which is you know our wheelhouse yeah. of bread and butter and the northern rockies and cool um you know beyond so that's that's a big one is it light can can you pick it up uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's the whole weight, the blank hole, uh, which you'll hear a lot of different weight discussions in the industry. Um, the blank hole is about 200 pounds outfitted. It's about 400. Um, so a little bit heavier than our Dory profile, but still a couple hundred pounds less than your classic, uh, you know, fiberglass boat is going to be in the 600. So 400 pounds takes a few guys. So it weighs actually, so the, uh, the skiff weighs less than your, your drift boat, your Dory. Uh, no, the dory oh. will still be about 25 pounds less. If you throw a dry storage box and a bench up front, you know, so pretty classic outfitting, yeah. it'll, those are the weights that I'm referencing. Oh, gotcha. Obviously, um, you know, so about, about 25 pounds less on the scale, um, for the dory profile versus the skiff, but the skiff has a much bigger base plate. So it rides higher in the water column because yeah. you're displacing more water. Um, cause it has a little bit more width to it. So, okay. Um, it rose light and honestly, I stop. if it takes me two strokes to stop the Dory, um, it takes me one stroke with the skiff. Wow. So it rose faster because of the, the, the geometry of that That's boat. Awesome. So That's awesome. it's a, it's a, it's a sexy ride and we're pumped for, Amazing. for to get more people in it. Amazing. So. What is the, on your drift boat, um, just quickly, what, what is the, the, de is it like, you know, you hear the drift boat 16 by 48, 16 by 54 inch. What, what is your typical drift boat? Uh, so, uh, 
both of them are 16 footers, uh, you know, in the center line length and they're both 54, yeah, 54 uh, at the Orlock on the beam. But in the, in the skiff profile, we take that 54 width and it essentially goes, you know, whereas you're at a perfect arc and it comes to 54 on the Dory profile, it's, then it starts, you know, tightening up, you know, up to the pronounced bow. You keep that 54 inches in width. Uh, all the way up to kind of right behind the the uh, front angler and almost at the knees of the back yeah, angler. So you big. have that width. Yeah, it's, it's big. Long. It's so tons. it's it's big, but you know it's not uh, super grabby and having that rocker profile on the front, like you're keeping that chine, uh, you know, a little bit out of the water in the front and the back to keep it sporty, uh, yeah. and agile gotcha. still. And for when you're ferrying, so it's, oh, right. it's a fun boat. Yeah. It's, it's a ton of fun to run. Uh, yeah. it's, you know, yep. it's a good one. We're yeah, pumped yeah. on it. So, so that's the, in the, and like you said, the 48 inch, which was typically when drift boats first got going, they were 48 inches on the bottom just mm-hmm. because that's what a piece of plywood was. But, um, mm-hmm. it sounds like also the 48 inch maybe is a little more maneuverable compared to a 54. Do you guys, do you do any 48 or do you find that? Or, or is that, we not, don't, yeah. um, we find, especially as you're, you know, you go back to who we're focused on and it's like, you know, anglers and gear and everything like that. I mean, they're going to use, we all use every inch that we can to try and keep things out of the way and clean and our boat outfitted. So I just think, feel like that, that, that 54 inches in width and what yeah. we have on interior configurations is a sweet spot that we don't yeah. really want to mess, mess with. with. It gives us, um, we, yeah, we like the interior configuration as it can be outfitted today. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, that's the thing. It gives you more, more room for packing weight too, which is nice. Exactly. So, you, okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, I guess, uh, Sean, I think that's about it. Uh, Cool. Before we get out of here, I guess in the next uh, in the next you know six months or so, anything new you guys got coming you want to give a shout out to? Um, you know something that's kind of cool is we've uh, you know integrated uh, a flat rod storage and a pedestal in the front seat to the dory profiles um, after the skiff, so that just came out. So oh, nice. and now you can have a rod tray in our dory profiles, just like we have in the skiff. Uh, as well as a pedestal up front historic, we, we could only do a bench there. Um, so we were pretty pumped on that. Once we flushed out everything in the skiff, we took some of the lessons we learned with, you know, bracing and different things like that and, uh, integrated into the Dory profile. So that's a, a nice feature that we've had a lot of people shouting for, for a long time. So, um, kind of cool to, to have some small iterations like that and, um, you know, we're always looking at new tweaks. So if anybody out there is listening and wants to see something different or has a question, you know, give us a holler. We're always down to talk boats. Sweet, sweet. So, yeah, if they want to find you, uh, anybody can go to just Boulder Boats, uh, uh, boulderboatworks.com, right? Yeah, boulderboatworks.com. There's some videos and pictures and contact info. And, or, you know, you can Google us and pick up the horn and give us a shout. We're always you know, it'll come to either mine or Trevor's cell phone generally. And, um, you know, we're always available. Perfect. All right, Sean. Hey, thanks for coming on and sharing uh, a little bit of background on Boulder Boats. This is, uh, you know, I think we're, I'm just connecting the dots a little bit and I think pulling Andy in and you guys, it's pretty cool to hear that history. And I'm sure we'll have some more, maybe some more uh, skiff uh, episodes here to, to dig into it. Cool. But yeah. And until then, well, thanks again. Yeah. Appreciate the opportunity. Always, always down to dial in. I love the podcast and uh, yeah, have a great day and let's get out and fish sometime soon. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we covered, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 179. If you get a chance, head over to uh, wetflyswing.com slash travel to find out which new trips we're heading out on this year and in the next couple of years. Hopefully as uh, COVID lifts, we're going to be getting back out there. This is a chance for you to connect with past guests, guides, and shop owners that we've connected with on, on this podcast. So it would be great to, uh, to see you over there at the travel site. Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon. I hope to maybe see you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes.